put mu y into all the Just remember that you can't put this new y, this new in-depth teaching of the divine truth coming directly from the eternal word to Louisa in old wine spirits. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit. Amen. Amen. Eternal Father, I fuse myself into Jesus to tell you, Father, I love you. I praise you, I bless you, I thank you for the gift of my humanity that you created. You created it to be made in an image and likeness of your beloved Son, Jesus, who is who said to his apostles, when you see me, you see the Father. So Jesus, inhabit our souls, our minds, our hearts, so that we can see the Father in you, our beloved Father, who longs to hear from his children on earth those words that Adam first spoke when he was created. Father, I love you. And when we live in this sanctity, That's what we keep saying each moment of every day, with Jesus, in Jesus, and through Jesus. Father, I love you. That sort of oversimplifies it. So when we give our fiat to this sanctity, which is the divine sanctity of God himself, It's not the sanctities that have happened in previous generations. So even when you go back and explore those sanctities, you still will not understand what this sanctity is until you read the Book of Heaven, which is a direct dictation by Jesus himself, the eternal word, speaking it into Louisa Picaretta, the first soul stigmatised in the divine will. So she's not the first in terms of the, she's the first in terms of the era, the unfolding of the history of redemption and sanctification. Of course, Our Lady is the first in all creation to possess all of the aspects of the divine will. So don't misunderstand me. Those of you who have studied the divine will know what I'm saying. Those who haven't will say, oh, she's saying Louisa is better than a lady. Hello. Hello. What's your name? Meredith. Oh, you're Meredith. Oh, hello. Oh, yeah, I got a bit confused before I thought Meredith was coming with Sue. But no, Sonia rang me and said, Meredith, uh, it's nice to meet you, Meredith. Thank you. Yeah. We've been communicating by email, but it's the first time I've seen your face. And now, so, the ladies from Brisbane, I wanted to put you in contact are here. Look, oh, everything's there. <laughs> Everyone that knows. So that's beautiful to meet you, Meredith. Thank you. It's always lovely to... Um, meet someone face to face after you've been communicating with them on email. So um, today our Lord gave me to speak on how this divine sanctity has arrived for us privileged souls in this generation. And I don't normally speak about the other sanctities, which Jesus calls inferior, don't get shocked, inferior sanctities, because the sanctity of all the former sanctities originate in God. 
and they're um, lived out in each individual soul, in each generation, according to how that soul practices them. So that's why you have degrees of sanctity in the saints, degrees of, of in the eras of the different sanctities, different ways of living in the will of the Father. So our Lord gave this to me years ago, but what he did this morning when I woke up was he gave me uh, more detail but it's only the shorthand version of what it really means. So I hope I can explore it as briefly as possible to allow you time to enjoy enjoy the lunch and then, you know, um, each other's company. And also during lunch you can discuss these aspects. And I typed it up in a document this morning, what, I, what our Lord was giving me in my, my heart and soul. And it's about the four arcs of God. And I'm going to go through those four arcs because we have entered into the fourth and final arc of salvation and sanctification, which is the arc of light. And this light is being infused into us by the eternal light himself. So the first arc is, can you see me if I sit down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay. The first arc was an arc of wood. And who was the builder of this ark? No. no. Very good. Give you a tip. <laughs> <laughs> this ark, Noah himself was the patriarch that those who boarded the ark must obey. So each of these arks had a builder, a patriarch, an entrance, and three levels. And I'm going to go through that with each of the four arcs of God until I bring you to the fourth arc, which is the arc of light. And I'm going to read just a couple of quotes to help you understand the importance of the one human being chosen to be the patriarch of these arcs and the one who must be obeyed at the cost of death. The quote from Genesis says this about the ark of wood, the ark which Noah built. I regret having made man. God said to Noah, the end has come for all things of flesh. I've decided this because the earth is full of violence and man's making, of man's making. Sound familiar? <laughs> and I will efface them from the earth. And because we're on the threshold, of this new act of divine justice, I wanted to take you through the words of God through these four arcs to show you where this is the chastisement and the destruction that precedes the resurrection of a new humanity happens in each case in these four arcs of God. So God said to Noah, make yourself an ark out of resinous wood and make it with reeds and line it with pitch inside and out. This is how to make it. And then if you want to go back and read that, it gives all the details, but I'm not going, I'm not going to focus on that today. I'm focusing on the main aspects. Now make a roof 
for the ark. Put the door of the ark high up in the side and make a first, second and third deck. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember the three decks and the entrance level is in um, a door high up in the side. One pair of all that is flesh and has breath of life boarded the ark with Noah. And so there went in a male and a female of every creature that is flesh, just as God had ordered him. And Yahweh closed the door behind Yahweh, behind Noah, sorry, mm -hmm. closed the door behind Noah. That's important too, because once those chosen have entered the ark, the door is closed to the rest of humanity. You'll see this in the four arcs as I go through each of them. If you fail to board the ark, you are dead. By your own choice. Because Noah spent a long time building this ark and the whole time he spent building it, he was ridiculed, humiliated, laughed at, but he persevered in obedience to God's will to build the ark. So all those who ridiculed him, criticised him, laughed at him, verbally abused him and possibly many physically abused him as well, <clears throat> did not deter uh, Noah. This is another important aspect of our life I'll get to later. Now, from volume 30, June the 26th, 1932, from the Book of Heaven, Jesus says this, Now, you should know that in this point of the story of the world, humanity merited that creatures might not exist anymore. He's talking about the era of Noah here. Humanity merited that creatures might not exist anymore. Wouldn't you just say that the current humanity is um, even worse, you might say, in that respect? Everyone should perish. This is Jesus speaking. Everyone should perish. Noah with accepting our mandate and presenting himself to the great sacrifice and for so many long years building the ark, he repurchased the world and all the future generations. This is due to one man's obedience. He repurchased the world and all future generations. As he sacrificed himself in a time so prolix, there's a book up there called The Prolonged Sacrifice Needed, which goes into the various aspects of that. Prolix means a drawn out, prolonged sacrifice. With difficulties, with labours, with sweat, thus he dispersed the coins not of gold or of silver, but of all his being in the act of following our volition. Now Noah did not live in the generative power of the divine will, but he obeyed it perfectly. Thus he put forth enough coins to repurchase, which is the same meaning as the word redemption, to repurchase that which was about to be destroyed. So that if the world still exists today, they owe it to Noah. So when you do your rounds, and uh, that 
I've done a book there, Acts of Love in the Divine Will. And when I do my rounds in the Old Testament, I, I focus mainly on the main patriarch, starting with uh, Noah, and even before Noah, Enoch and... Um, you must do, this is part of our work, is to enter these acts of the patriarchs, the saints, the holy men and women of the old covenant to divinise their acts. And by divinise, divinising, for example, let's take Noah, the acts of Noah, building the ark, uh, suffering, as God said here, you know, blood, sweat and tears and all the rest for decades, building the ark that saved humanity. We put our I love you on all his sweat, his tears, his humiliations, his obedience to God's will despite humanity laughing at him, saying you're stupid, you're foolish, ha, 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 you think God has told you to do this, well, aren't you, you know. So when we enter these acts and put our I love you and we divinise these acts doing our rounds of love in them, Noah receives an increase of accidental glory in heaven. You give joy to Noah and all the others by putting his acts which only had a human merit not a divine merit, and uh, you divinise them so the actual act that he did back then, which only had a human merit for him, but it was so great because it was obeying the divine will, you divinise that act, then it becomes an eternal act through you. And that eternal act expands and magnifies all that he did on earth which saved the human race and he receives an increase in glory in heaven through you being the channel for the humanity of Jesus to divinise his acts. Now what do you think Noah might do in heaven after you've given him such a tremendous gift Father. Beautiful. Thank you, Sonia. I'm glad you said that and not what I thought people might say. The Father receives an increase. Well, the, you, 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 it's words, language is not accurate. Our human language can't describe what happened because you say, well, how can the Father receive extra glory? Because the Father is full of glory. But Jesus explains this in the book of heaven because Our Lady did it. She embellished, beautified, magnified every single act of the Trinity by her response to it in the divine will. So your response to these acts of all the saints of the Old and the New Covenant before the era of the, of the Fiat Voluntas Tour, actually magnifies the glory due to God from humanity. That's why the Magnificat is our theme song, which reminds me we should play that at the end, Michael, the Magnificat. What does Our Lady say? My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, if, you, if you're a kind of um, person that analyzes everything beyond uh, reason, you'd say, well, how can a human being magnify God? That's not right, you know, people who are critical. Her soul magnified the Lord because she lived in divine will. And it was the divine will in her that had the capacity to magnify every act of the divinity. And you have been given that same capacity. So, thus Noah put forth enough coins to repurchase that was about to be destroyed. God's given you those coins in your acts 
done in the divine will to repurchase this humanity that is about to be destroyed on a huge level the prophecies, all the proof prophecies say two-thirds of humanity will be destroyed. But who is responsible for the resurrection of this new humanity? Yes. Who? Yes. Those living in the Bible. Which is? Us. There you go. So, Stop bemoaning about the chastisements because they're going to come. We've gone past the stage where we can do all the acts of reparation and, you know, it's, it's decided now. So it's going to come. But you've got the job to do of repurchasing the resurrected power of Jesus and he says in one of the teachings of the book of heaven the church will rise more glorious as it was meant to be after all these acts are done in the divine will the resurrection of the church will happen along with the resurrection of this new humanity and who is responsible for this resurrection. We yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love to hear you say that. <laughs> because the re you must recognize who you are before you can apply this generative virtue that God has given you. If you don't recognize the power that's been placed in your hands, you'll never live in the fourth degree. Recognize who you are. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. So stop telling Jesus how unworthy you are because he already knows it. He doesn't need to hear it from you a thousand times because you are unworthy. But you've got to get over yourself and your unworthiness because that's already been decided you are unworthy and you are nothing without Jesus without me you can do nothing so it's not you that's doing it it's your fear to surrender your nothingness into his humanity so he can resurrect humanity in you and through you the divine will is the sepulchre of the soul. So what does a sepulchre do? Speak out loudly. Wonderful. Burning. I love that. The sepulchre encloses a dead body. Who's the dead body? So you were dead, people might look at me and say, that's the same Geraldine that I met 30 years ago, but it's not. Yeah. I'm a member of the royal family of heaven and I am a queen. Because why? Because Jesus and Mary told me. You will encircle our throne and you are all kings and queens once you live in the fourth degree. So if you're not living in it, you better desire to live in it and you better embrace it as soon as possible because only living in that full possession of Jesus will you be able to resurrect the church and the world from its shocking, miserable state of corruption and decay because that's what is happening now. And I don't have to spell that out and I don't need to talk about it because it's self-evident. It is self-evident. And anything that looks all nice and perfect is just a mirage because the corruption has occurred from within through human wills that have rejected the divine will. So that if the world still exists, they owe it to Noah that with his sacrifices and with 
doing our will as we wanted it done. Notice that, as we wanted it done. There's lots of people that think they're doing the will of God, but they're really doing the will of God according to their own idea of what the will of God is. And we've all been there. We've all done that at some time in our life, you know, yes. thinking we're doing God's will until God's will really embeds himself in us and then we shock horror. Wow, I have to redo my whole life in divine will to repair for all the imperfect ways I have thought I lived in his will and I did it. A prolix sacrifice wanted by God says great things. Universal goods are attained and a sweet chain that ties God and men together. We ourselves don't feel ourselves escape from the labyrinth of this chain so long that the creature forms for us with a prolix sacrifice. Rather, it is so very sweet and dear that we let ourselves be tied by her as it seems and pleases her. You are able to ask God, command God to do something if you live in possession of him because it's not you that is asking, it's Jesus, the eternal word, asking his father, father, you know, our father. Right in heaven. That's how Jesus is always deferring and referring to his father. That's how he lived his entire life on earth. Now, I can see I'm going to have to skip a lot of quotes here if I'm going to get on to the Ark of Gold and the Ark of Gold. Mm -hmm. Did you read the volume 30? Uh, June the 26th, 1932. So, I'm just seeing, it's a fairly, um, I'm going to read this because it's got foundational lessons in it. This is the second reading on the Ark of Wood, then we're going to move on to the Ark of Gold. And I'm going to ask you if to see if you're scripturally um, educated to see what you can say to that. Volume 28, March the 12th, 1930, is another reference to Noah and the building of the ark. And this is very, very significant when you come to the ark of light. My daughter, when our infinite wisdom must give a good to the creature, it doesn't calculate the time. Rather, it calculates the acts done by the creature. Now, can you imagine in the time, the era of redemption, if everyone had to listen to Jesus and done what he asked them to do? It wouldn't have taken like two and a half thousand years and more to embed redemption in humanity because they would have been obeying. Jesus. But they didn't, did they? So, we look at the acts of the creature and then he numbers the acts and you know what that means in the divine will. Therefore, we do not measure the time, rather we count the acts that creatures have done. So in that time that seems so long to you, you know, when, <laughs> when is it going to happen? The acts that we wanted in order for us to come to redeem man had not been done. Only the acts determined to make the good come, not the time. Even more so, acts constrain our justice to exterminate creatures from the face of the earth. That's the acts of disobedience. Because God gives us a long time before he chastises us. He's very patient. 
you've experienced that, haven't you? Uh, I mean, it took him, uh, how old was I? Say 50, 50 years before he um, took hold of me, you know, and transformed my life in a real way. I mean, I've always been a Catholic, you know, doing all the usual devotions and things. But when you become claimed and possessed by God, when he redeems you from all your disorder and your uh, misinterpretations of things, that's a wonderful experience. It's beautiful. Acts constrain our justice to exterminate creatures from the face of the earth as it happened in the flood, which only Noah merited to be saved with his family. See, this is also repeated in the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Only one, only one man and his family were worthy to be uh, saved from the destruction. I want you to remember that out of the whole of humanity, in these cases, only one was justified sufficiently to be saved, and the rest were destroyed. Imagine what's going to happen in the next chest. By obeying our will and with his long-term sacrifice of building the ark, through his acts, he merited the continuation of the new generation in which the promised Messiah would come. Are you seeing Noah in a new light now? Yes. He's like this just one just man that merited the future generations into which Jesus was born. Imagine how loved he is by the Trinity, how loved he must be. Um, a long-term and continuous sacrifice possesses such attraction and enrapturing strength to our supreme being that they make him determined to give great goods and continuation of life to mankind. See, this one... This one person merited for us the mercy of God through succeeding generations. We, we should be so grateful to these great saints of the old covenant, you know, because they didn't have what we have through the fiat of redemption and sanctification. They didn't have sanctifying grace in that sense through the sacramental life. It was their long-suffering obedience. So, uh, to make him determined to give great goods. If Noah had not obeyed us and not sacrificed himself to fulfill such a long work, he would have been overturned by the storm in the flood. And not saving himself, the world and the new generation would have ended. Do you see what a long-term and continuous sacrifice means? It is so great that it puts one into safety and makes the new <coughs> life rise in the others, as well as the good that we have established to give. That is why for the kingdom of my divine will, I wanted your, Louisa, long and continuous sacrifice of so many years in bed. Your long sacrifice put you in safety more than the ark in the kingdom of my divine will and inclines my goodness to give such a great good and to make it rain in the midst of creatures. So that's the end of the little reflection on the Ark of Wood. But doesn't it expand your understanding of how to remain in this prolonged 
sacrifice of suffering that each of you in various ways is living through. Because your prolonged sacrifice, even when you're not getting anything yourself, you've got, let's say, you've like Noah, let's say you've got the world against you. Every, all the members of your family think you're crazy. <laughs> and you, you've you got, um, then the church, you know, thinks you're crazy, yes, I've been through that, with a succession of parish priests. And um, everyone thinks you're crazy because you have divorced yourself from the world and from the external manifestations of sanctification in order to enter the sanctuary of light to read the book of heaven to allow the impregnation of the divine will in yourself through your divine husband now this is what you do in the in the ark of light so we're going to go through this now the second ark is the ark of gold who was the builder of that ark Moses. Moses. You can speak out. Okay. Is it the book of Numbers? It's, uh, it's, it's it no, no, it's in Exodus, Exodus. mainly when he started to get instructions mm -hmm. uh, when he went up the mountain how to build the ark. Yeah. And I actually read the whole <laughs> chapter this morning. Uh, but then it goes through from, it starts in sort of Genesis, goes through to uh, Exodus and then of course poor old Moses had a lot of struggles with the people of God, the chosen people and so he had to keep climbing up that mountain and fasting for long periods of time and they still were troublesome and difficult and uh, mm -hmm. always returning to their sinful uh, state. Well, the current state in the church, there's great numbers of people who call themselves Catholics, but they're still living in the world as well. It's like one foot in the world and one foot in the in the church, and it's sort of like what Moses, what what God. Um, directed Moses and Noah, of course, and all the great patriarchs, is when he builds this ark, it was an ark whereby the people of God who had returned to their sins were able to procure for themselves an entrance point back into the divine favour. And each of these arks has a patriarch and each of these arcs has a builder. So the builder of the Ark of Gold is Moses. And you can read Exodus 20, chapter 25 if you want to check this out. And the builder of this ark, oh, type that twice, the builder of this ark is Moses. The patriarch to be obeyed is Moses. So first he chooses the one to build the ark. But then for the others, like with Noah, it was his wife, his three sons and their wives. And there was a bit of rebellion there along the way. So the, the patriarch is not only the builder of the ark, but he's the one the others must obey. This is a key point. You know, you say, well, what's the difference? You know, they must be obeyed at all costs, otherwise they will die. And there's a scene where the ground just opens up and swallows two of these boys and just... That's it. That's oh. it. Read, read, uh, read Exodus and I love these chapters because what it shows me is the symbol and the analogy for what's happening now. But you've got to read them over again to see it. The... Um, the entrance point in this ark is um, 
this obedience to Moses in this case is the entrance point because he was the only one who spoke to God face to face. And if you did not obey Moses, for example, Pharaoh refused to obey Moses several times and resulted in the ten plagues of Egypt. Miriam, Moses' sister, who saved his life, Miriam and Aaron, his brother, started humiliating and talking about Moses behind his back. God gave them leprosy because they disobeyed their brother Moses, who was the chosen patriarch to lead the people of God through the desert to the promised land. So when Moses went up the mountain, God gave him very detailed instructions how to build the ark. And this is the ark of the new covenant. And it was made of acacia wood plated with gold, but a lot of the other um, vessels and things were made of pure gold. So the people of God gave Moses or the people who melted down all their jewellery and everything to procure all the, the gold to build this ark. Now, what are the three levels in this ark? See, there were three levels in the ark of wood. I didn't go into what they were, but I, and I'm not sure how true this is, but I saw the bottom level was where all the animals and the manure from the animals and everything was at the bottom level then perhaps all the plants and the herbs and that on the second level, then, then Noah and his family on the top level, right? But these three levels are very important when it comes to the era of redemption and the era of light with Louisa. But in the, in the building of the Ark of the Covenant of the Golden Ark, there were three entrance points, you could call them levels. There's the outer court where only the lay people were allowed to gather. Then there is the holy place, which is an entrance point that's like, um, you know, in the traditional mass, it's more defined in the traditional mass because the priest stands below, it used to be eight steps, and these all symbolise when Jesus was being condemned by Pilate. He had to walk up these steps to the where Pilate was the authority, the worldly authority, and then he was judged. And so if you watch films which I show on my retreats about the traditional mass, all of these aspects of Jesus' life are symbolised in everything that happens there. But it goes back to Moses because... God ordered Moses to um, consecrate a priesthood and this is the Levitical priesthood and they were the only ones allowed to enter into this holy place. Then there was the archpriest which at that time was uh, Aaron and he was the only one allowed to enter the holy of holies. So there you have these three levels and the people were outside. They said whenever Moses entered the tent of meeting where the ark was, they would all come outside their tents, right? They're pilgrim people, they're living in tents. And they would stand at attention for the whole time Moses was inside the tent of meeting. They would not move or do anything while he was in this ritual entry into the divine presence. And wouldn't the cloud come down? Yes. Over the tent yes. And over this holy holy. That's right. And the cloud is um, it's a, a symbol if you read the um, when Solomon built the temple the same thing happened. It's the called the Shekinah or the it's a sign of the glory of God entering into that space. In the traditional mass, we use the incense. It's also, by the way, in the Book of Moses, very specific um, spices and herbs were used for the um, incensing. 
of this Holy of Holies. And um, I read the whole chapters this morning. And he said, the, this mixture, God said to Moses, was not to be replicated in the secular order. It was a specific mi mi mixture that was only to be used when this ritual of the high priest, Moses is the main one at this point, but Aaron is the high priest, and only they could administer this incensing of the holy place. So it's that once you read once you read these books you understand the why the traditional mass was formulated by the church specifically um, to represent all of these instructions God gave to Moses. So uh, disobeying Moses, disobeying the patriarch was a well, let's say a mortal sin because you basically died if you if you disobeyed. And then you've got the three levels and then the Holy of Holies, I've spoken about that. Um, I could give you the reading, but it's Exodus 25. I'll allow, if you're interested, you can read it yourself, but it is the most beautiful description of how the altar, the altar of incense, and all the various furnishings were made to um, furnish this sanctuary where a human created person chosen by God was able to speak to God face to face and God would descend into that place. So this, these are all the prefigurements of what's happening in the future generations. So I'm going to move on now to the Ark of Flesh, the third Ark, because I want to get... Uh, is someone give a timekeeping for me? Because I, I lose myself... 45 minutes. What is it, done? 11.05. Oh, good. Yeah, that's good. So we have still got an hour to do the last two Arcs. I'll leave it up to you if you want to read um, the, the Ark of... It's, oh, maybe you won't enjoy it as much as I do, but when I read it, I, I see what it means for us today. You know, I see the beauty of... I mean, it's a direct um, instruction from God himself. You know, it wasn't a man-made thing. Moses received this on the mountain from God himself, as well as the testimony, which is the Ten Commandments, inscribed on stone to be placed inside the ark. Are you understanding what the ark of gold is and what the testimony is in the new era? Are you understanding it? So what is it? Come on. What does the ark of gold represent in the era of redemption? No, you're of redemption, no. not the father. Oh, okay. yeah. What is the ark of gold? The What's the new ark of, of the covenant of gold? The crucifixion? No. no it's our lady. That's it. Oh. Well, the ark of gold in which the true testimony of God and the new law of love, divine love, is inside Mary, who is the new ark, and then we're about to speak about that. The ark of immaculate flesh. But even as you're describing it, I can feel heaven like God's describing heaven, He's bringing it down in yes. this ark. Yeah. And as you position everything, the smell of it, the, you know, could you imagine? It's, it's just creating. He's already bringing the, I suppose, the template of what Our Lady is yeah. in this beauty. That's it. And all the internal parts of this beauty. That's it. Is all in this. Mm. Yeah. So if you read, if you go back and read the Ark of Gold of Moses, you'll start to see in profound detail what he does in the Ark, his Ark of Flesh, Immaculate Flesh, Mary. Mm. 
Now, God could not descend, as he says in the book of heaven, just because Our Lady was immaculate, just because she was sinless, just because she was a virgin. He said none of these things had a capacity for me to incarnate myself in her. There was only one reason he could incarnate himself in her. What was it? Her fear? Her fear. fear. Living in the... Yeah, I know what you said. That he, living in the divine will, possessed of it from her conception. He could not have incarnated himself in her unless she lived in God as God lives. She was possessed of God. Now... So she was a divinised human being. He could not have entered her in his own humanity, which was flesh, taken from her flesh, but in one of the lessons in the Book of Heaven, he said, in actual fact, it looks like I took my humanity from her, but she actually took her humanity from me, her blood, this is very specific, her blood had its origin in his blood because in the divine will there's no succession of acts. It's all one act. Her blood was originated in his blood, his humanity. Her humanity originated from his humanity even though it has not had not yet been conceived in her. So... This is a big question, which I won't go into, but that's the reality. Now, when they have actually done tests, scientists have done tests on the um, over 800 or more statues that are weeping tears of blood in the current, uh, current uh, uh, world we're living in, there's probably more than a 1,000 now. When they've examined the blood, coming from Our Lady's statues and examine blood because some of Jesus' statues are weeping blood. It's exactly the same blood, the same uh, composition of blood. So I don't want to get on these sidetracks because I'm, I want to keep to the point of the four arcs. But unless you understand this, that the arc of immaculate flesh, which is Mary, is was only able to conceive Jesus, the Word, and make him flesh because the divine will reigned in her. And you can only gift a humanity to God if it's the divine will generating him in her. So it's the marriage of her fiat with the fiat of the Trinity. It's the marriage of the two that conceived Jesus, the incarnation. Now, when you give your fiat in Mary's fiat, this is what, by the way, what consecration to Mary means. It doesn't mean saying a little prayer, I consecrate myself to you, yes. Holy Mother, which I've done and we've done hundreds of times. What it really means is you enter her fiat. You marry her fiat, you become one with it. Because that's the only way Then she gifts you with her gift that she received the capacity to incarnate Christ. Now, you receive the capacity through our Blessed Mother to incarnate Christ, and he says it's incarnation, it's not a mystical thing, he told Louisa, and it is not union with Christ. He says this is not union, Louisa, this is incarnation. Because she kept saying, isn't this a kind of mystical thing, you know, and he said, no, it's incarnation. So every act, I'll read you the quote, every act you do in the divine will is an incarnation of Christ. And it's our Blessed Mother 
the Ark of the, the, the Immaculata, which shares her sovereignty with you. You're still nothing, by the way. You know, because <laughs> as, soon as, you give, as soon as you give your fear, that's what you're doing. You're burying yourself inside the sepulchre of the divine will. And you never, never step out of it. The only way you can release yourself is by a conscious act, like Adam and Eve made a conscious act to say, no, I don't want this. I want my independence, you know, every teenager. Mum and Dad, no, we're leaving home now because I want to live my own life independently of you, thanks. Well, that's what Adam and Eve said. It's been very nice of you, um, God, uh, our Father, to create the entire universe for us. How wonderful. We've had a really good time up till now, but now we want to go off on our own and do our own thing. Well, isn't that repeated in almost every, every, every human being gets to that stage, you know? Currently, the majority of the world, that's what they're saying. We don't, I, one of my daughters said, Mum, I don't, I don't need God to be good. I just, if I'm a good person, then that's good enough. If I act a, a, as a good person, that's good enough. I don't need to receive that goodness from anywhere else. No, my, my eldest daughter says she is God. Oh, yes, yeah, so there was a card up on her, my daughter's fridge and said, I am God. So um, they're just going back to the Adam and Eve story again and they're destroying not, not only their own lives but um, who knows, their children's lives. Well, that's, and, that's all my children have got Mary in their baptism baptismal name and I've given them all to Mary and I trust that Mary is going to bring them so I'm not yeah. going to worry about them. I just laugh. I just think it's so funny. But if you live, if, if Helena, is it Helena? Helena. Helena. Yeah. If you live, you can't just, like we used to do that before we came to the divine will, abandon all our children to Mary and we've done that right. But now you, she's saying, okay, Helena, yes, up till now I've, you've abandoned them to me, I'm their spiritual mother, but she says, but now, Helena, I'm giving you my gift so you can work with me to become a spiritual mother to them, to help them, to save and sanctify them. So it's your cooperation with her fear in the rounds that attains the maximum graces for your family and your friends and well, all of humanity. I can't say anything though, I, I can pray. Yeah. Because if I say anything, this, oh, here she goes again. <laughs> oh yeah, I understand that. I, I do, but I'm very grateful my children don't want anything to do with me because it gives me 100% of my time to uh, do what God wants me to do. Now, the whole reason when you see the different patriarchs and the heads of these fiats is they have to abandon worldliness of all kinds. And in some cases, as Jesus said, if you want to come to me, you, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, what he means by hate is he means you have to reach a point where you become unconcerned about their behaviour, even in supposing God, and you are you become so detached that you choose Him first above everything else. If you don't choose Him first, and you try, you're keeping trying, relying on your own efforts, which I'm sure all of you have done, mm -hmm. uh, you will not succeed because He requires that. As with Moses, as with Noah, he requires that perfect detachment from other human beings. And that means your own children, it means your own uh, parents, it means your own siblings, all of the, that. 
So if they're trying to tease you back into their environment, no. well, well, you can't. <laughs> Mum, my children would say to me, Mum, why can't you just be a normal mum? <laughs> and I say, well, what would you? What do you mean? What would you like me to be? It to become normal. And of course, normal means. Uh, I was told by one of my children one day, "Well, why don't you go and get a boyfriend or something? <laughs> and you can go to parties and you can be normal. You know, go out and see a show, and then I'm normal, right? So, um, as if I'm going to do that." You know? So, but that's what they think, you know, you're not normal. Uh, join the local RSL or the, the Bowls Club or something. And when you ask, let's talk about detachment, what about from spouses? Yes, you have to be detached from spouses. Um, that doesn't mean you walk out on your marriage. I actually did. Uh, I had to, was forced to do that. But my marriage um, collapsed because uh, being um, daily mass goer, all of that, and I used to love reading the scriptures, that wasn't conducive to um, my husband's idea, you know. So even in marriages, they call it in the initial stage of the church, they call it the Pauline principle. If you were married to a Jew, that forbade you to follow Jesus Christ, you were given permission to leave that marriage because if your spouse is aggressively opposed to your faithfulness to Jesus, you no longer have a marriage that can actually survive. There have been some great saints like Saint Maria Tagi who had an abusive husband, an abusive sister-in-law, and she heroically knew how to live within that marriage. But it's not always the case that certain people can do that. They can't, some people don't have the, um, it's not, I don't like saying they don't have the virtue, I'd rather say uh, if the psychological, if that person is going to destroy you, either physically through threats to your life or your psychological health, you, you are free to separate. Divorce is a different thing, but I, I, I just, I would never advise, I've been a counsellor to abused women, and I would never advise a woman uh, to put her own life at risk in situations because she has children to look after and also it's not a healthy environment for children to witness what goes on in abusive marriage so there's all these different levels of understanding it's not so you don't have to read canon law and you won't find the answers there it's I can two, tell you two Corinthians 7 14 isn't it well I don't know thank you for telling me it is I know it's there but I don't know the Verse and what is it, Corinthians? Verse 7 and 14, yeah. Okay. okay. So if your husband is um, of a different faith or something, then you're free to make it. Yes. But if you can live happily together, that's okay. Uh, yeah. That's so okay. I've seen marriages where the husband's not Catholic. I've witnessed this many times in my parish. He'll drive his wife to church and he'll sit in the car and read the newspapers <laughs> while she's going to Mass. I'll tell you another story that uh, a lady friend of mine has taken over my scapular work. Uh, she's very young and her husband's not a Catholic. He goes to Mass with her, he prays the Rosary with her and now he is enga fully engaged in helping her in the promotion of the scapular work that I originally started, the United Scapulars of Mary and Joseph. So here's a man who's not a Catholic, he hasn't made a decision to become Catholic, who's actually been a Catholic mm. and totally fully supportive of his beautiful young wife. So that obviously is, is, is even a Catholic husband doesn't necessarily offer his wife that kind of support. Mm -hmm. So there's all these, 
you know, you have to take each marriage, you know, separately. Um, but in, in, in the case where um, I lost a friend, she died from uh, continual abuse of her husband. And um, I watched it happen, but she decided to return to him, which I advised against. But when she returned, it, it uh, manifested. There were lots of graces, spiritual graces, but it cost her her life. And so she laid down her life for her family and she achieved her goal because her family now is the most united, one of the most united families I've seen and that was her intention. So how do we get onto this? <laughs> yes. But, but after it, goal. <laughs> oh, the art of goal. So, oh yes, incarnating Jesus. So. Not, not, I call it the Ark of Flesh because principally the Immaculate Flesh through which we are saved is Jesus' flesh. See, but, but Jesus did not get his body except through Mary's fiat. So it's like one, they're one. So this Ark of Immaculate Flesh is both Jesus and Mary. So I put here this morning, in the persons of Jesus, the Word made flesh. That's the ark of redemption. Uh, the Immaculate Conception, our mother, who um, the title she gave to St. Bernadette, I am the Immaculate Conception, and Abba Joseph is included. We, we're not going to go there today, but there's three, remember I said there's three levels? So, you've got in this trinity on earth, most of the saints, St. Cardinal, St. John Newman, um, uh, St. Francis, um, uh, Francis de Sales, um, a lot of the saints called the Holy Family, the trinity on earth, the mirror of the heavenly trinity. And therefore, we have these three levels. Joseph is of the lower level in terms of sanctity, but he is actually the patriarch of the family. And uh, Mary and Jesus obeyed. The king and queen of heaven obeyed Joseph. So I put here the patriarch um, to be obeyed in this ark is Joseph. Now there's a whole book written by a former chaplain of Lewis, Father Andrew Dosay, who to whom Joseph appeared to, I spoke to him many times on the phone because I read his marvellous book, it's still available on Amazon. Uh, the, the, there are two titles but it's the same book. And it's called Discovering St. Joseph. And he was a theologian. And he saw and understood. He said, everything in the kingdom, because the kingdom is in fully in Jesus and Mary, the entire kingdom, he said, obeys Joseph. Everything in the kingdom obeys Joseph. He had the ability to see the, the importance of this obedience. Why is this? Why did the King of Queen of Heaven, why did the will of the Father decide that his beloved daughter and his most beloved son, the Word made flesh, would obey a created male? Well, I've been given a lot of this, but I'll just give you one aspect. Adam was a created male. He was an immaculate conception of God. He didn't come from a human mother or father. He was an immaculate conception of the divine will, Adam. And he was a true son of God because his true father was God himself. But this first created male, 
rejected his father and he disobeyed his father. In order to repair for this shocking act of disobedience, because Adam was meant to be the head of all creation, the, the father of the patriarch, if you like, of all this creation, divinised creation, because he was given the gift of the divine love. So in order to repair something, Jesus does the exact opposite. So in order to repair the pride of Adam, he took the lowest place that any human being could take, in any God, as God. He obeyed his creator, his created father, in the greatest act of humility, a God obey his creature in order to redeem creatures from the effects of original sin, the pride of disobedience. Now, it's easy for Jesus to obey his heavenly Father and it's easy for him to obey, obey his beloved mother because they, they're totally one. But to take that lowest place, which Father Andrew Doze understood perfectly in his book, it's a beautiful book, have you read it? He says, everything in the kingdom walks in those steps of Jesus and Mary in obedience to Joseph. So when Joseph would say to our Blessed Mother in the middle of the night, get up, we're going to Egypt, she didn't say it because she knew, had more insights. But God withdrew a lot of illumination from her in order to procure from, from her a greater virtuous act of abandonment and submission to her husband. Also in this abandonment and submission, she's repairing for all married women's disobedience and rebellion against their husbands. So there's layers upon layers of this because in the Holy Family they all obeyed each other. But when there was some critical situation such as the life of Jesus was threatened, in his infant, from the moment he was conceived his life was threatened, who is the overarching protector of that family? So, Joseph is the patriarch of this ark. It doesn't mean he's the holiest. He wasn't. Jesus and Mary were the holiest. But didn't, Je didn't Jesus say in his gospel that whoever takes the lowest place mm. in heaven will have the highest place? Mm. So it's this humility and poverty of spirit in Jesus and Mary. It's a big, big thing. So... What is the entrance point into this ark? Now, this is the ark of flesh, don't, immaculate flesh. What is the entrance point? And I was pondering this this morning. And I had my scriptures open because I, my favourite gospel is the Gospel of John. And I remember Jesus saying, I am the gate. Mm -hmm but it's like uh, he's not the gatekeeper. So the entrance point is the gate, Jesus, because he says, I tell you most solemnly, who does not enter the sheepfold through the gate, which is Jesus, but gets in some other way, is a thief and a brigand. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the flock which is Jesus, but the gatekeeper lets him in. And who is the gatekeeper? And I can prove this by re reciting uh, the founder of Opus Dei, for example, on every t key to every tabernacle, they have the words, go to Joseph, inscribed on the key, saying Joseph is the key to let you in to this sanctuary. 
which is the Holy Family, because Joseph's the father, he has the authority and the keys to keep people out or to let people in. And he's protecting this sanctuary. And what is happening in this sanctuary? What's happening in that inner sanctum of the Holy Family? They're redeeming the whole world. Yes. Rede redemptive acts, but what else? Sanctifying acts, divine acts. Mm -hmm. That's it. They're doing both. They're doing the redeeming acts in hiddenness because it's a hidden sanctuary. Remember when you go into the Holy of Holies in the Old Covenant, Moses, it's a hidden place. If anybody, if any lay person went through that curtain, they were subject to death, punishment by death. Because this was the inner sanctum where the ark was, the Holy of Holies, you see. And this was a directive given by God. So in this case, the true ark, the true ark is Jesus and Mary because they're one. That's theologically true, by the way. They're not two separate, they become one is protected by the gatekeeper. This is in the Gospel of John 10, chapter 10, verse 7. Because Joseph has the keys of entry into the Holy Family. That's my words. The sheep hear his voice, the shepherd's voice. One by one he calls his own sheep and leads them out. And when he has brought out his flock, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow because they know his voice. They never follow a stranger but run away from him. They do not recognise the voice of strangers. I tell you most solemnly, I am the gate of the sheepfold and anyone who enters through me will be safe. So the three levels in this ark of flesh are Jesus, Mary and Joseph. So you know we go to the first ark of wood, there were three levels. In the second ark there were three holy places, the outer realm where the laity are, the holy place and then the holy of holies where nobody may enter except the one consecrated to enter in there. This is very important for the next star. But you also see the home in Nazareth, it just replicates too that the Ark of Wood, just with their their various work. Uh, maybe the image you, of, you mean the labours they did? The labours they did and then Jesus obviously the Ark of Wood, Jesus dies on a cross. Yeah, you can see a lot of symbolism the more you go into it. Um, Sonia, uh, the more you read scripture, of course, you go deeper and deeper. But today we're trying to focus on the main symbolism here. The other thing is very important, though, which I haven't written here this morning, but I write it in almost all my books, is in the notebook of childhood memories, which I haven't got in front of me, um, I don't think of got it in this book. Uh, that is when Jesus was in her early childhood or her early teens even. Um, and she was given obedience to write everything that happened in her childhood. She didn't want to do that, but she wrote it down in a small document. You can find it on your website, you know, any divine or website, the Notebook of Childhood Memories very important to read it because the instruction Jesus gave to the weasel was, I want your life to be lived with us in the Holy Family, and he calls it the House of Nazareth. And I want you to do the works that I have done, his acts. But not only my acts, I want you to do the work, the acts of my mother and of St. Joseph. And a direct quote is this, and look at St. Joseph to see if your acts are like ours. So what's he saying there? If you want the perfect model 
for how to live inside of us, Jesus and Mary, look at St. Joseph to see if your acts are like ours. That's a direct quote from the Notebook of Childhood Memories. And then he instructs her never to leave them, to live inside the Holy Family. And that is, is our principal focus. This is one reason this is the oratory of the Holy Family and I have the Holy Family there because I never like leaving the Father outside the family. I don't like seeing the mother and child alone because I was abandoned by my father when I was four years old and grew up in a fatherless, uh, my, my youth in a fatherless household. And I know what it's like not to have a father. And I think this is the age of families without fathers, and we need to reinstate fatherhood in the perfection of Joseph. And he even appeared to Sister Mildred New Zealand America, which Father Thomas Celso promotes all the time, Our Lady of America, he promotes her. And Joseph appeared to her and said, God wants all fatherhood to be re-established on earth through me. This is a direct uh, command. And he wants first Wednesdays of every month, to, to just like the first Friday, first Saturday, to be mass confession, uh, the same criteria, to honour St. Joseph in his role in the Holy Family. So you meditate, he said, when you're doing your joyful mysteries on the first Wednesday of each month, meditate on them from his acts, Joseph's acts. And then he said, all fatherhood, God wants to be established through me on earth. And that her messages were approved by her bishop, who's now dead. And I, I firmly, I mean, I got that even before a priest sent me all these revelations to Sister Mildred, but I understood that was so important. That's why I came here to Joseph's place, to live in Hermitage, was to, re, to pray for the re-establishment of a holy patriarch on earth. Because children who grow up without fathers are most vulnerable to fall into the worldly ways of uh, this culture, which is a culture of death. I can guarantee you that, and all my five children fell into that culture, and it's affected not just them, but their children, and it will affect their grandchildren, and so on. So, the entry point, we get, we're up to the arc of light. Now, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to read you at least one quote from this. Um, it's so important to understand the way God our Father works through these pa chosen patriarchs. Who built this ark of light? Jesus. Well, Jesus does everything, but the Creator. Who built? Who built? Who is the Ark? Anyway, who is the Ark? The Spirit, the, spirit, the Trinity, the heart Jesus of the Trinity, the divine will. It's called the in theology. It's called the art of appropriation. So you're not making a mistake when you say the Trinity, but Jesus is very specific. The main actor in the Trinity in the creation is? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. No, like the main divine actor in the fiat of creation is? The Holy Spirit. No. The Father. Oh. The Father. Thank you. No, darling, you've got it. The, 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 the Trinity is the Father, Father Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. They're all create, creating. So. The, cre the fiat of creation, the main and primary actor in it is the Father. In the fiat of redemption, the main and primary actor is Jesus, Jesus God the Son. 
In the field of sanctification, the main primary actor is thank you. Okay, so when you're specific, it doesn't mean you're leaving out the other two because they all operate together. But each fiat has a primary actor to bring that fiat to completion, okay? So who's the primary builder of the ark of light? So that's the, this fiat. The Holy Spirit. Well, he is the primary actor. And who is the human person that he is Louisa. Thank you. <laughs> now we're getting there. Yeah, because this is important. He's building in Louisa the new ark of light. Okay? And this ark, of, it's all light. I'll explain to you why it's light. That doesn't mean grace isn't there. That doesn't mean anything else. It just means the primary infusion into Louisa is light. Because Jesus is speaking into her <coughs> word by word, inscribing in her soul, on the blank parchment of her soul, in letters of Light. 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 What? Light. Light. Someone said something else. Light. In letters of light, what he will make her understand little by little as she receives each word from him. I like it. I'm, get, I'm running out of time because I was, would like to read you what this one word, of one word of the eternal word does. What time is it? Quarter to twelve. Quarter to twelve, thank you. So, I'm just going to read you a little quote. Um, how does she, how is she invested? I'm reading you this quote, right? Now, if this happens in the natural order, he's talking about sowing seeds and all of that. Oh, we have to get talking about the patriarch that must be obeyed in this in this uh, fear. And we've got to talk about the entry into this fear. Okay, the entry point. Now, if this happens in the natural order, much more easily can it happen in the supernatural order of my will. By entering into it, how? How do you by, enter into by it? Fusion. Oh, by fusion. 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 By fusion. Yeah. By entering into it, the soul forms one single act with the divine will. And as though naturally she takes part in what the divine will does and contains. In one single act, she takes part in what the divine will does and contains. I should be picking you up off the floor by now <laughs> because that means everything in God, in one single act fused into him, now is in your possession. Everything. Everything that God is, Everything that God does and everything that's contained in God has just been gifted to humanity through you because it's not just about you like it was in the sanctity of the virtues. It was about I need to become holy. I've got to go to Mass and Confession I did because it's all about me becoming holy. This is a sanctity that's not about you. You're, you're dying, you're dead, you're dying to yourself, right? Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces a tree, and the tree produces lots and lots of flowers and fruits and more, hundreds of seeds, and then there's 
trees of those that climb for every generation. So, more so in the order to live in my will, the soul is stripped of the garments of the old guilty Adam and is clothed anew with the garments of the new and holy Adam. Who is that? Jesus, the new and holy Adam. Her garment is the light of the supreme will itself through which all its divine manners are communicated to her which are noble and communicated to all. This light makes her lose her human features and restores in her the physiognomy of her creator. This is transubstantiation of Jesus' humanity into you. And the more you die to who you are or who you used to be, the more Jesus can infuse and transubstantiate himself into you. What is the wonder then if you take part in all that the divine will possesses? What is the wonder? Because it's not about you. You haven't done anything except die to yourself. It's not about you. You are now possessed. When you go to Holy Communion, Jesus comes into you, body, blood, soul and divinity. But he says as soon as the species are consumed, if you're not living in his will, he leaves. It's a temporary it's a temporary uh, living and indwelling. Only when you live in him fully does he remain with you in a perpetual um, consummation of your humanity. Um, what is the wonder then if you take part in all that the divine will possesses since one is the life, one is the will. Therefore, be attentive. I recommend to you to be always faithful to me and your Jesus will keep the pace of making you live always in my will. I will be on guard that you may never go out of it. Volume 19, February the 28th, 1926. But then he goes on to say this, and this is the three different levels. In the, uh, in the arc of life. There are three different levels. Does anyone want to have a stab in the dark about that? What are the three levels of living in the arc of life? Well, the, the last one will be completely possessed by the light. Yeah, yeah. Like the full day sun that's in it. So the other parts would be partially enlightened. What's with, the partial part? Living a bit in that human will. And living... No, 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 no human dying. will. No, die yourself. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But there's three different levels you live in once you are activating the... In Mary. In Mary, she's one of them. Well, that, that's... Yeah, well, you could go back and say, like Jesus said, live in us, Jesus, yes. Mary and Joseph. They are three different levels, but I mentioned them in the fear, the redemption. So in the fear... Faith, hope and love? Illumination. Oh, well, faith, hope and love, that's a theological virtue. Very good, Helena, very good, but that's not what I'm looking for because okay. what Jesus says here... I'm going to read a bit, a bit... I'm not going to tell you the answer until I read a bit of what Jesus <laughs> says. And I'm, I want you to tease your brain to see if you can guess what it is. But th it's volume 19, February the 23rd, 1926. But this is not all. Obviously, I've left out the paragraphs that aren't necessary. It was necessary, befitting and de decorous for the newborn of my will... That's Louisa and that's you, each of you. For the newborn of my will, you become newborn as soon as you give your fear. And every act you do in the divine will, you're newborn again. 
And then in the next act you do in the Divine Will, you're newborn again. Okay? Uh, and for our will itself, that she would unite herself to that single act of the Eternal One which has no succession of acts. Creation. Uh, yes. Yeah, but what's the three levels? Oh. <laughs> Creation, redemption, sanctification. That's it. That's yeah. it. So you go, because Jesus describes this here, and just as this one single act gives the divine being all the greatness, the magnificence, the immensity, the eternity and the power, in some it encloses everything to make whatever it wants come out of this one act. In the same way, our little newborn of our will, uniting with this one single act of the eternal one in which there is all the acts of creation, Who's the prime actor? God. Oh, please. Who's the prime actor in the field of creation? Oh, thank you. Okay. Who's the prime actor in the field of redemption? Jesus. Who's the prime? God the Son is a better way of putting it. Who's the prime actor in the field of sanctification? Oh, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So when you enter the one single act of God, okay. the Blessed Trinity, you possess all the acts of creation, all the acts of redemption, and all the acts of sanctification. And how do you come into possession of these acts? Refusing. Yeah, into them. And you start off like a little baby, just drinking sip by sip, doing your rounds, and then Jesus takes you. He says to Louisa, I'm leading you. I'm going to show you what acts to do. And as you become proficient in doing your rounds, he expands those rounds. You got, start seeing things you never saw before, you know, and you go, wow, you know, like that lady at the retreat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and... Um, uh, and while doing one single act, she will be reborn continuously. And But reborn to what? What's happening to you? Listen. You're, going, you're being reborn to new beauty, to new sanctity, to new light, and to new likeness of your Creator. You're clothing yourself in light, the light of your new, the divine version of yourself. That's what you're clothing yourself in when you do your rounds of creation, redemption and sanctification. And as you are reborn into our will, the divinity feels repaid of, for the purpose for which it issued the creation. Do you see how you make God happy in this life? You become like Adam and Eve were at the beginning before the fall. Before yeah. the fall, but more than that. Yes. More than that they were, because they hadn't passed their test yet. And it feels the joys and the happiness that the creature was intended to give to God. Come back to it. So you're the cause of joy, you know, the litany of Our Lady calls of our joys. By entering her, you become the cause of joy to the Trinity, while the rest of the world is causing them pain and suffering and sorrow. So, clasping you to the divine bosom, the divine will fills you with joy and with infinite graces and it manifests to you more knowledges about our will. And giving you no time, it makes you be reborn again in our will. Moreover, these continuous births, we're not going to go there today, it's too long. These continuous births make you die continuously to your will. So if you say to yourself, how can I how can I stop doing that? You know, the thing that 
sort of is a bit of a problem for them. You just keep doing your rounds, and eventually Jesus kills that human, that human self, that human will. He gives death to it. But you don't have to do, like in the sanctity of the virtues, right? It was you doing the work. Oh, I must do more penance. I must say more rosaries. I must stop doing that. How do I stop doing that? It's all about, I have to do something for it. But this way, he acts in you to pulverise your weaknesses and your sinful tendencies. That's why it's so easy to live this life. Uh, it, uh, blah, 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 blah. These continuous births, uh, to die continuously to your will, to your weaknesses, to your miseries, and to all that does not belong to our will. How beautiful is the destiny of my little newborn. So aren't you happy? <laughs> Like what you're learning today, if I could explain to you one, one extra knowledge, volume 17, one extra knowledge in the divine will, thousands upon thousands of angels descend and prostrate themselves in this place to adore a new act of giving birth to the divine will in these knowledges because they're not intellectual knowledges. They are births, lives, divine lives, being born through your welcoming of the fear. That's why you're here, to welcome this fear, to learn more about how to live in it. So too, I was born once in time, but that birth makes me be born continuously. I am reborn in every consecrated host. I am reborn every time the creature returns to my grace. The first birth gave me the feel to make me be reborn always. This is how divine works are. After they are done what once, their continuous act remains without ever ending. The same will be with my little newborn of my will. After she is born once, the act of her continuous birth will remain this is why I'm so careful not to let your will enter into you. And I surround you with so much grace so that you may always be reborn in my will and my will may be reborn in you. And I'll end this by a, a, a short passage about the importance of the rounds. Only whoever lives in my fear, embracing everything together with it, takes everything as in a handful and encloses everything in that volition in which it lives, ascends into our unity to bring us everything and give us the true homages of all the effects of our soul act. That is why making your rounds in our divine will not only gathers everything, but also communicates its act to all created things. Note that it's not about just you and Jesus. You're communicating these acts to all created things in such a way that all of heaven poses itself to adore together with your adoration. Do you understand that if you do one single round in the divine will, that all of heaven prostrates itself before that round, that act, adoring what the divine will is doing in you? They're not adoring you, but they love you so much, I can tell you, because you've given Jesus your humanity in which to act. That's the one single thing you do. You say, Jesus, I'm nothing. Take me, all of me. You know that song we used to sing? All of me. All of me. Why not take all of me? And, and the words are beautiful, you know. Can't you see? I'm no good without you. Take my heart. 
Oh, and see, it's a perfect description of what we're doing with divine love. So what we'll do is, um, Michael, I think we'll play that song to finish as a prayer because it's like um, making new wine in the... We're getting rid of our old wine skins, right? We're getting rid of them. We don't need them anymore. And we're make, Jesus is making this new wine, and this new wine intoxicates us. We're always happy, always happy. Even if you've got aches and pains and sufferings, you don't, you're always happy because Jesus knows what he's doing with you. So, Julie, who was a patriarch in the... Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you. The patriarchs in the in the sanctity. What the ark of light? Yeah, the ark of light is um, principally the priests that are uh, Saint Denis de Francia is the short answer. But Louisa was taught from the very beginning to submit to the priests that were put over her. Some of whom caused her immense suffering. But when the final one was chosen, Saint Nicola de Francia, he is like the patriarch because he's the first to publish her writings. And he was the first to bring this art of life into the world to be able to be read by us. I wouldn't have, I, we wouldn't have had the Book of Heaven if it wasn't for Saint Nicola. And, and all the priests that ordered her to write. So these are the patriarchs, if you like, but Jesus, they're acting in accordance with the divine will, even the ones that made her suffer. So that, but I look at Saint Denibale, I love him so much up there, that beautiful picture. He is, uh, his heart is incorrupt. Mm. And he is the one that took all the, this treasure that was planted in Louisa and brought it to the world. Mm. And so I see him as the patriarch of this ark of light because even from heaven, Jesus said, your mission does not end when you die and mm. go to heaven. Mm. He's continuing that mission mm. on earth. And and he should be Michael's patron saint, and he probably is, you see, Michael, because Michael Prince and sends the Book mm -hmm. of Heaven out yes. to lots of yes. people in Australia. Time, yes, And yes. he has a marble statue in the Vatican. Yes, uh, he's so got an enormous statue in the Vatican. Oh, okay. If you go on to the internet mm -hmm. and you put in statue of Saint Denis de Francia and um, I've got all his letters as well he wrote to Louisa. Um, he God, I call these um, wonderful works of God, need two, male and a female, and I call them virginal natural unions for the sake of the kingdom, right? So this marriage of between, virginal nuptial marriage of between Saint Enable and Louisa is a union which brought this celestial doctrine into the humanity. And there were those certain priests and that were opposed, but there was a whole sequence of priests that were instrumental in or, uh, commanding her to write because she wouldn't have written if, he, if she wasn't commanded. So you might say the patriarchs of this fiat are the priests that are put as authority over the um, victim soul. And Jesus says this in volume 10, he said, every victim soul should have a priest or a priest should be very attentive to each. We, can, we don't have priests here in Australia that are capable of doing that, so forget about that situation. But he did say the priest was important for him to operate through the priest in guarding uh, the victim's soul like Louisa. But he also said in volume 10 
that the site in Nibelay had the office of my mother and St. Joseph over me. So St. Nibelay had the office of Mary and Joseph over the humanity of Jesus. And so St. Nibelay protected and guarded over Louisa and Jesus told him, it's in volume 10, um, that he, or it could be volume 5, I think, he had this office of Mary and Joseph over his humanity. So every priest has that office over a soul that lives in the divine world. 